Well, good morning, church. Let's stand and sing together. If you're at home watching, I encourage you to stand where you are. Let's sing this out. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. It's so nice to see all of you here. Welcome to those of you worshiping with us in person, and a special welcome to those of you joining us online this morning. Uh, my name is Zach Anderson. If I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you yet, I'm one of the pastors here at Covenant. Uh, and I just want to take this moment to remind you uh, that before you are a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, before you are of any nationality, before you are of any sin or skill or good thing that you have done, 
You are a child of God. That is your identity. That gives you infinite worth. And we love you because God loves you. So thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Just a couple of quick announcements, invitations for us this morning. The first, if you were interested in participating in the Schoology training, just a quick reminder, that is today at 2 p.m., Uh, So I hope you'll join us for that to learn the Schoology system. Second invitation um, to the whole church, next Sunday is a very special Sunday. It's Confirmation Sunday. Uh, And normally uh, we do Confirmation Sunday. Our Confirmation service is a part of our regular worship service. Uh, This year we're doing it a little differently. It's going to be at 5 p.m. next Sunday. Um, And we are gathering in person. However, the in-person element is just for the families of those who are being confirmed. We have 11 students who are coming to profess their faith in Jesus and to be baptized. Um, But this is where I want to invite all of you, the church, even if you're not the family of those being confirmed. um, I think it's really important that we come around them and pray for them. And so at 5 o'clock, it's going to be live streamed. And I invite you to not just view the service, but to take an active approach to viewing the service. Uh, We have a responsibility as the church to come around our young brothers and sisters in Christ and pray God's blessing over them, God's grace upon them. Um, And so that's next Sunday at 5 if you want to join in online and and, uh, cover these students in prayer. I hope you will join us in doing that. Um, As we continue in worship, let's pray again together. Heavenly Father, you are in this very room, in this very moment. You have called us son, you have called us daughter, you have called us beloved. And for that we worship you. And so as we gather and sing your praises in Jesus' name, as we listen to your word in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, please move in our hearts. Prepare us to hear what you have to say. Block out the distractions. Let us hear what the sovereign God of the universe has to say to to each one of us. And as we continue to prepare our hearts for this, let us pray together as children of God the prayer that Jesus taught us to to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, Well, church, if you want to stand with us, now's a good time to do that. But as always, take the posture of worship you feel most comfortable with. We're going to sing this song and give praise and glory to our King. We serve a God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-being. He's a God who never changes. So as we sing these words that he keeps on getting better, it's not that he's changing, he's constant, but it's the more that we get to know him, the more we learn about who he is, the better he gets. Let's sing this out, let's give him glory this morning. It's 
Proverbs says to trust in the Lord with all your heart, to lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will set your path straight. We keep that scripture in mind as we sing this, as we praise him. No matter what goes around, goes on around us, the one that we can cling to. We can be joyful in that. We can be peaceful in that. Just set our hearts in the right posture of worship. If it's not already there, let's get there, church. We serve a good God. We serve a loving God who wants to meet with us. And if we're not meeting with him, what are we doing here, right? We're here for a purpose. Collectively, we're going to give him glory. Let's sing this together.
Jesus, we lift this up as our prayer this morning. That we will not lean on our own understanding, as tempting as that is. As difficult as that is to resist. God, we, we lean on you. Trusting you with our whole heart. Knowing that you are all-powerful, all-knowing, all-being. Your ways are so much higher than ours. Your thoughts higher than ours. So God, we, we trust you with our whole heart this morning. We don't grab at other things. We don't hold on to other things. But this morning we choose to hold on to you as our Savior, as our love, as our counselor, as our leader. We worship you. We worship you. Amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, I, I invite you to remain standing as we continue in worship by affirming our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Will you join with me now? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. 
At this time, I invite the children to jump on uh, Cove Kids Online. If you're here in the room, uh, the code is, uh, is available. It's the same as it always is at covenantconnects.life. Uh, if you're online with the streaming, uh, there's that space for the kids to learn again this day uh, about the life and ministry of Jesus. So I hope that you will uh, turn your children's attention there as uh, they join Miss Patricia online. We're going to be turning to the gospel of Matthew as the kids are uh, jumping online. The gospel of Matthew chapter 9 verses 9 and following. But before we, uh, we get there, I do hope you'll be turning with me there if you have your Bibles out. Uh, but before we turn there, I was, uh, I was struck over the course of this week by something that uh, I ended up feeling a sense uh, as though I had left something unsaid last week. So I know not all of you were in worship with us last week, but, but I did talk about how natural it is for us to experience a fear of death. And, and we heard from Paul in Romans chapter 6, use the word dead, death, or died over and over again, 15 times in 14 verses. And so when we heard that, I wanted to, to say, hey, that should startle us. It should awaken us to what the message that God uh, is bringing to us there in Romans 6. But one thing I left unspoken and I was reminded of it this week as, uh, as a young man in our community that, I was, uh, um, that I'm thankful to have known and to have loved and to have experienced life with as he died this week, tragically and all too early. I was reminded that I left something unsaid last week, that we as Christians have no fear in death because we have hope in Christ. And it comes to us in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. I want to be sure that we're clear on this because while it is natural to fear death, we as Christians have put on something entirely new, uh, a new way of being, a new way of looking at the world, and a new way of experiencing and encountering death because it, the Scripture says it this way, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. He breaks the power of the devil and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. Before we know Christ, we are held in slavery by the fear of death, by the devil. But because we have hope in Christ, we no longer fear death. Because it is just a, a blinking of an eye as we are ushered into eternity with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I, I felt that I left that unsaid. I, won't, that's a whole, I feel like I can start a whole other sermon there. But that was left undone from last week and I had to, I had to complete it. So we're in Matthew today. That's a two-for-one sermon today, just like two-for-one hurricanes, 2020. Bless the Lord. Okay, uh, if you have your Bibles with you, if, with, me, with you, I would invite you to turn with me there, Matthew chapter 9, 9 through 17, as we together hear from the word of the Lord. As Jesus went on from there... He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. And while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come, have not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners. Then John's disciples came and asked Jesus, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus answered, how can the guest of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast. 
You see, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the, pa- the patch will pull away from the garment, making it tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. This is the word of God offered to us, the people of God, in its reading and in its hearing. So we give thanks to the Lord God Almighty. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Gracious God, we come before you in this space, in this time full of hope, the hope we have in your son, Jesus Christ, that gives us confidence to approach your throne, to approach your word. Lord, we trust that that you have a word for us today. Lord, we pray, we pray, Lord, speak to us. What is it that you have for us? For it's not by our own understanding, but it's by your love and your grace that you meet with us in this space and time. Lord, open our eyes that we would see, our minds that we come to know and understand your word and your will. Open our ears that we would hear. Open our hearts that we would feel the power of your word and our hands that we would offer grace to the world. We pray this together as the people of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just over a year ago, I was blessed with a a return gift. I've told you this story uh, last fall, but the return gift was uh, was, uh, my 66 Chevy truck uh, was gifted back to me by uh, Donna Jordan and Cliff Jordan, who uh, I sold the truck to in 2004. And it was a, a tremendous uh, gift. It's still overwhelming. Every time uh, I, I get in the, 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 the bench seat of that truck, uh, I, I, it, it still fits me. You know what I'm saying? It still fits just right. And I love the gift that it is to be able to drive it again. But one of the things I didn't tell you was just uh, a few weeks after I brought the truck back from Atlanta, Georgia, uh, the starter went out on the truck. Uh, it just wouldn't turn over. It would crank and crank and crank. It wouldn't turn over. And, and so uh, I, I thought, wow, this is the opportunity, right? And in 1995, 1996, 1997, I rebuilt this truck. Uh, I replaced starters and rebuilt carburetors and did all of this work on this truck. I was like, let's see if I still have it. You know, because, because well, one of the things about this uh, 66 Chevy pickup truck is like you could literally sit inside the engine compartment to work on the engine. It doesn't have all of those digital elements that ruin our abilities to work on our own vehicles. I think that's on purpose, by the way. Uh, you know, so, so I, I decide I'm going to replace the starter. So I, I, I crawl underneath my truck. I, whenever I used to work on the truck, I would put it up on, uh, on ramps, but I don't have ramps. So I crawled underneath it, and things were a little more snug than they used to be underneath the truck. Uh, my belly was rubbing up against the, uh, the front axle as I lay underneath the truck. And the starter is a relatively easy thing to replace. A couple of bolts around the wire harnessings and, and then uh, three uh, primary anchor bolts to connect it in. And so I, I, I was able to, uh, to break the bolts and, uh, and, uh, and release it from the engine. And so then I was able to take it over to AutoZone and show them my, my starter. And they were like, wow, haven't seen one of those in a while, Uh, you know. And they found uh, a supplier that had a new starter, and I had to wait a few days, and I got it back in, so on and so forth. Well, here's the deal. So I get the starter, and I'm really excited to put it back in so that I could know that I fixed something, right? Like that's what you want whenever you're working on something to bring it to completion to know that you've succeeded. Well, uh, I, I lay under the truck. And I'm holding this starter in place, and I'm getting the bolts to thread in, and I'm working for 10 minutes, 15, 20, 30 minutes pass, and I cannot get this starter to fit. 
It's just something is wrong, and I'm beginning to think something is wrong with me. And so uh, after 35, 40 minutes, my arms are totally pumped out, and I can't hold the starter in place while I'm threading the bolts in on my own any longer. So I say a few choice words to myself and to God, uh, and then we, in these moments, uh, move on from that. I go take a shower. I wash all of the oil and grime off of me, and I release myself from that, other than the fact that my truck is now every day a reminder of my failure in front of my house. And so two weeks later, I decide it was me, but I am better. I am now better than I was before. I'm going to work this out. I crawl back under my truck. It's even tighter than it was a couple weeks before. I guess all of my sadness caused some binge eating. And now all of, uh, all of this, uh, this dirt and grime is falling on me. I work again 30, 40, 45 minutes. I even get Aiden to come out to help me some. And all of it is to no avail. And I say more choice words before God and in my own heart and soul. And I scream a little bit in frustration, and Aiden says, well, what are you going to do? I'm going to pull it to a mechanic, which takes all of the humility I can muster because I'm devastated. One of the things I'm so excited about with having my old truck back is to be able to work on it, but I just can't get this new starter to fit on this old truck. So I take it to the mechanic, and the mechanic's like, wow, I hadn't seen one of those in a while, and they're really excited to be able to work on it. Everybody's excited to see the truck, and so uh, they work on it. They work on it for, uh, for a day. They give me a call, and they tell me, well, we don't know where you got this starter from, but it just doesn't fit. This, old, this new starter that you provided us just doesn't fit on this old truck. You need to take this new starter back and get them to give you another one. And so we go back to AutoZone. We order a different brand. Sure enough, uh, the, the, the bolt was like an eighth of an inch off of the alignment, uh, the harness where it needed to, to thread. And so uh, I take it to the mechanic. The mechanic does it. I pay an exorbitant amount of money for them to, uh, to bolt three bolts into the harness. But... Then it fits, and I realized that when something is even just a little bit off, if it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. And Jesus is working with us today in the Gospel of Matthew, and he's working with the Pharisees, and he's working with the disciples of John to, to help us to see, to help his disciples to see that there are certain things that, that we think fit that just don't fit, that, that, that even if they are close, they're not quite right. And so we, we need to make the proper adjustments so that we can align our thinking in a new and fresh way so that it will fit and align just right. There's actually three different, uh, different arenas in which Jesus and this topic of fit will come up. Uh, the first is uh, when Jesus is meeting with, with the tax collectors and the sinners. We, we've heard this story before maybe where, where Jesus is calling one of his disciples, Matthew, and, and, and Matthew is a tax collector, and tax collectors are known to be sinners amongst sinners. Wretched human beings because not only uh, do, they, do they sin, uh, but, they, but they impose and oppress their brothers and sisters in such a way that their sin is, is seen before not just God, but before everyone. It is public sin. And so when, whenever Jesus calls Matthew and he says, hey, come, uh, come and follow me. And then he goes and eats with Matthew and he, he's eating with sinners. The Pharisees come and they're, they're, they're questioning Jesus' disciples. And they're saying, why in the world would your master, would the one in which you follow, eat with tax collectors and sinners? This makes no sense. And it says that Jesus perceived what they were thinking. And he addressed them directly. And in this space, he turned to them and said, hey, hey, look, you have a framework through which you are seeing the, the, the word of God. It's called the law. And you believe that, that law 
and lawbreakers do not mix. They do not fit. Law and lawbreakers do not fit. But, but that's, that's a, a different paradigm. I'm not, I'm not the one that is calling you to follow the law. I'm the one that is your savior. I'm the one that is your savior from sin. And so I want you to know, Pharisees, that the savior and sinners fit. And that's one of the great misconceptions about the church, is it not? People believe that we're still in a Jewish legalistic world that says you cannot come in unless you are already entirely well. Unless you are without sin, you're not welcome here. And that's why outsiders believe that the church is full of hypocrites. Because outsiders believe that we believe that we're all perfect. But in fact, we all meet because we know we are in need of the one who is perfect. And by his power has been able to make us perfect and receive life in him. It's an entirely different way of seeing the world. So the Pharisees think that law and lawbreakers don't fit, but Jesus comes and says, sinners and a Savior fit. And we can receive that today and know by God's grace, we have received salvation in Jesus. And so we now are entirely connected with God in Jesus Christ. The second question of fit comes from not the Pharisees. And normally we're used to the scribes and Pharisees, the, the, the Jewish leaders being the questioners. But this comes from, from John's disciples. Remember John the Baptist, cousin of Jesus, the one that's in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, all of that. Well, these are people that are following John and, and they're, they're out in the wilderness with John baptizing. And so in that space, uh, they, they see that there's a difference between what John is doing and what Jesus is doing. They, they see the difference between what, what they do as followers of John, what the Pharisees do as followers of the law and leaders of the temple, and what Jesus' disciples are doing. And there's a, a, a significant difference that they come and ask about. They come and they ask, they say, why is it that Pharisees and followers of John fast regularly and the disciples of Jesus are not fasting. Well, well, first, just to be sure that we're on the same page, understand what fasting is. Fasting is, is, uh, is withdrawing something from our lives, typically food or drink, in order to turn a, a physical experience into a spiritual encounter. Fasting is to take a, a physical experience experience of loss or need to draw us into a spiritual acknowledgement of how that need is fulfilled. And so for John's followers and for the Pharisees and scribes, this was done regularly. But Jesus highlights for, uh, for these disciples of John, hey, hey, if you were to have the spiritual present with you, then you have no need to enter into that physical denial to encounter the spiritual because he is already here. So Jesus, who's both fully man and fully God, the divine incarnate in the flesh, God with us, he is there with the disciples. And since he is present there, fasting and the presence of Jesus do not fit. Because the physical is already manifest in the spiritual. But Jesus says clearly, when I am not with you, then you will need to fast. Because whenever you fast, you will encounter me all the more. Through that physical sacrifice, you can encounter me through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is... A, a, a wild revelation because Jesus is clearly 
without making any bones about it, without, without beating around the edges. He is talking to, 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 uh, to scholars, Jewish scholars, people that understand the word of God. And he's saying, look, you've been waiting for the, a Messiah. You've been waiting for God to be manifest here on the earth. I am he. You know, sometimes uh, fo- folks want to say, well, Jesus was just a good guy or, or Jesus was just a prophet or, 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 or th- none of that's possible. There's no if and or but about it. Jesus clearly says, including here and other places, I am the son of God. I am the spiritual made physical. I am here with you. And since I am with you, Meet with me. And so the disciples hear that and have to see how their framework would shift in order to understand Jesus' presence with them. Well, there's another question of fit that then Jesus lays out. And he he lays it out through a, a, a paradigm of the old and the new. And we've been talking all year long about the fact that that God is making all things new. In fact, God is making us new. God is making all of creation new. And when God is making all things new, God is allowing that old to fall away. But we still reach back for the old. So right now we're digging in together. What does it mean to let go of the old and to live in this new life that we have in Jesus? Well, Jesus speaks about this. He says... This old and new, it can't fit together. The first way he talks about it is he talks about it with wine and wineskins. This is actually the second thing he talks about it, but I'm working it in reverse. Are you all with me? He talks about wine and wineskins. He says, all right, so so, so here's the deal. You have new wine and you have old wineskins. Would you put those two things together? Does that work? Like, think logically. And, and we might not think much about wine and wineskins because we have bottles and corks, amen? And sometimes we even have boxes with spouts. Uh, that ain't so bad neither, all right? But, it, but, it, but here's, for that culture, they were clear and they were aware that wineskins for new wine had to be new. And that old and new could not fit together. In fact, he, he, he says something that everybody would have known. We don't know it, but they would have known it. If you put new wine into an old wineskin, here's what happens. The wineskin is actually going to burst, and all the wine will be wasted. Come on. Sadness. So why would you endeavor to put new wine in an old wineskin? The old and new do not fit together. This is a question of container. I want you to think about the wineskin as just a container. I want you to think about the new wine as being Jesus. And and whenever Jesus is coming into this container, think about your container, your life. How, How are you bringing Jesus into The old life with which you knew. It has to be different. You're entirely made new. You need a different container, a new container to hold this new life that we have in Jesus. Think about how we do this. We know this. We say, okay, Jesus, you're welcome in my life. I got about 10 minutes a day for you. I'm going to squeeze you in, in between uh, when I eat lunch and when I'm due back on the clock. That's when me and Jesus are going to have time. Y'all act like y'all don't know. When do you make time for Jesus? That container of how your life is organized and how you orient your time and how you set up your day It would be different if it was a new container to receive this new Savior into. How else 
Uh, we, we, we have these containers of our relationships. And we say, Jesus, you're welcome in my life as long as you don't interfere with this relationship and that relationship because those relationships, I like the old way in which they worked. We do this, that, and the other in this relationship, and we behave this way, that way, and the other in that relationship. And, and you could have these new relationships over here, the ones that I have at church. You could have my church relationships. But my college relationships, you ain't got no part of, Jesus. Boy, y'all look timid today. Are you picking your toes up off the ground or something? Or maybe... Maybe sometimes we, we have our, our cultural containers, you know, we, or, or maybe even our political containers. And we're not going to let Jesus into those things. We're going we're, we're to say, hey, Jesus, you're welcome in my life, but you're not welcome in, in my politics. You're, not, you're welcome in my life, but you're not welcome in the way in which I culturally uh, operate in the world. We're going we're gonna, to like segment off our lives as though we could put Jesus into an old container. And he's clear. It does not work. You cannot contain Jesus in your old frameworks of being. When he comes into your life, he comes in so that you are entirely made new, that you have a new container, a new framework, a new way of operating so that socially, relationally, culturally, politically, everything is infused with the holy presence of Jesus. And it takes a new container in order to receive the new life that we have in Jesus. There's one more way in which this new and old fit is, is articulated by Jesus. He talks about having a, a hole in, in some clothes and trying to put a new patch on some old holy clothes. And, and he says, hey, the, the patch is going to rip away. You, you think that you could patch it up, but it's actually not able to be patched at all. Well, I remember whenever I moved to Creekside, uh, Lauren and I moved from, from Bryan College Station. And, and I had a habit of going to the grocery store in, in, in basically pajamas, right? I, I would just wear some ratted out shorts and a t-shirt to, to, the, to the HEB in, in Bryan off of Villa Maria. And then whenever we moved here, one of the agreements that Lauren kind of uh, put upon me wisely, I believe, was, hey, when you go to, out in public, when you go to the HEB, you can't look like a hobo anymore. Like people, people don't need to see you in your ratted out pajamas, but the more I, I grew comfortable with you, the more I grew in community with you, the more I went to H-E-B in my pajamas. So if you've seen me in H-E-B in my pajamas, bless you, okay? Well, I have this one pair of pajama pants. It's my favorite pair of pajama pants. In 2001, Lauren had bought me, bought me this pair of, of American Eagle uh, pajama pants, and uh, I, I, I love them. It's like just wearing, a, wearing your, your whoopee from, you know, when you're a, a baby. Like, it's that thing that, a whoopee? Come on, you, got, you know what a whoopee is? You don't know? Like, like your baby blanket. The, you're, you're, Oh my gosh, y'all act like y'all don't know nothing today. So, you know, these, these, these pants are, are precious to me. And, and actually, I, got, I have a long sleeve uh, navy and, and gray shirt that uh, I also got like in 1999. And, uh, and both of these, this is like, this is, this is the perfect outfit for me. And so I wore it to HEB one day recently and I got home. And, uh, and Lauren noted for me, which I, I don't pay attention to because I just love these clothes. She noted to me that I just went out in public with a shirt and pants that were covered in holes. And I was like, you just mean these holes like here at the bottom of the sleeve? You know, hey, well, you know, you got a shirt from 1999. It's bound to have a couple of holes in it. She said, no, look at your shirt. And I held it out. And there are like little holes like all over the shirt, including some of them in my special spaces. And, <laughs> and then, then uh, she said, but look at your pants. 
And I was like, yeah, you know, they're tattered all around the waist and the bottom's like, like draping out. She said, look at your backside. And I looked at my backside and I had a hole in my pants that big. And I had just gone to H-E-B with some green boxer briefs, just all sorts of hanging out for the world to see. <laughs> and I start thinking, I could patch these up, right? I love these clothes. These clothes are that kind of special to me. In fact, I'm gonna, I, I want these clothes to, to, to stay with me forever. But then Lauren clearly says, you need to go through your clothes and throw away any clothes with holes in them. Because when it gets a hole in it, it's time to throw it away. And Jesus is saying for us, here, look, look, you think that, that when you could just identify some small area of your life, some thing that you're going to put on, and you're going to say, oh, there's a hole there. I'm just going to patch that little piece up. But, but what you're failing to realize is there's holes all over it. And, and, and you need to, to change your framework so that you're not just about repairing, but you're about replacing and that's actually how Paul lays out Jesus' teaching in the Gospel of Matthew for us multiple times over across the letters to the churches as he talks about what it is to be clothed in Christ. This isn't just about repair, it's about replace. And so we're going to look at three passages very quickly so you can see how Paul does this and you can understand that, that this, this is an entire shift. In Galatians chapter 3, Verses 26 and 27, here's how, how Paul puts it. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, and you've clothed yourselves with Christ. It's not a patch of Christ. You've been clothed with Christ, entirely new Close. In Romans 13, verse 14, it articulates it this way. Paul writes, Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus and do not think about to, how to gratify the desires of the flesh. If you want to go back just one verse in Romans 13, it starts to list all the desires of the flesh. And, and it, it just falls short because there are so many more than can be recorded in any one space. And so it says, hey, you have the desires of the flesh, these ways of brokenness, these ways of sin. You're not about just repairing those small arenas of your life. You're actually about replacing it. You're now clothed with Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then in Colossians 3, verse 12, it, it breaks down what that looks like for us. So that it's not just generically clothing ourselves with Christ Jesus, but it's specifically what are we putting on. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, gentleness, and patience. We are not about repairing our brokenness in part we're about having an entirely new container with which to allow Jesus to come into. You know, sometimes I think that, that we look at our lives that way, though. We, we act as though we're going to be able to, to look down and, and we're going to see a tear in our knee. Any of y'all ever got a, a knee tear in your jeans, your favorite pair of jeans, because you wear them so much, and then, and then they tear in the knee, and you think you're gonna, supposed to keep wearing them, but... As Lauren said, you're not. You got to throw it away and get some new jeans. But, but you see, you look down at your jeans and you have a tear in the knee of the jeans. And, and, and what you actually need to do is you need to get entirely new pants so that you could bend your knees to Jesus and meet with him in prayer. You look at your sleeve and you have some tears in your sleeve and you need to realize that you don't need to just patch that up. You get entirely new shirt so that you can reach out and give a stiff arm to the devil. You look down at your shoes and you see that your shoes, the 
soul is coming apart and you think I'm just going to get some glue and put it back together. But you actually have entirely new shoes so that you can run and not grow weary. You can walk and not grow faint. You have entirely new clothes. They're clothes in Jesus Christ. And you don't need to repair them anymore. You now have been, they've been replaced and entirely made new. This container, this wineskin that we're putting the new wine that is Jesus into, you you actually need to smash the old containers. If I was a youth director and we were at a youth camp and we had a bonfire outside, I'd pass out containers and we'd all go outside. And as we lit the bonfire, we would throw the containers in the bonfire and make sure that they smashed so that we would realize we're smashing the old containers so that we can celebrate the new container that Jesus is coming into. Do y'all? get me we are made entirely new and yet we act as though we're going to hold on to the old that we're going to repair the old that we want to cling to the old and Jesus is saying those just don't fit I don't fit in the old if you want to receive the new life I have for you then you must receive it in a new and fresh way. Don't try to box me in or contain me, Jesus says. This new life I have for you is greater than anything you've ever known. You're not throwing away the old just to get something worse. Whenever you throw that old away, you're going to get new And glorious gifts from me. And it will be more than you could have ever asked for or imagined. Because it is new life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray together. Almighty God. Lord Almighty, you you know our tendencies... You know how we so often, all too often, try to box you in and and force you to fit into what we think we need. But it's not about what we need, Lord, and we know that and we confess that. It's about being made entirely new through the power and presence of your son Jesus in our lives. Lord, we don't don't desire to contain you or to box you in, but we want you to invade every corner and crevice of our lives. Allow uh, allow us to to be made low, our pride to, to be removed so that you might invade our hearts, minds, and souls so that we would be clothed in your son, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for your holy word that reveals to us the life-changing transformation you have for us. We pray all of this in the powerful and precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. In the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil, I now surrender. You are breaking new ground. So I yield to you. trust you I don't need to understand so make me a vessel
church. Let's stand and rejoice. Let's rejoice this morning that we have freedom in Jesus. Let's get our hands together this morning. Amen. Amen. 
I want to continue to offer a word of thanksgiving for your continued support of the ministry here that we share in at Covenant through your tithes and offerings. If you're online or if you're in person, you can give online at covenantconnects.life or if you're in person on the way out, there is an offering plate there as well. Receive now this benediction. Lord, we go forth from this place celebrating the new life we have in your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we offer our whole selves to you so that we might receive the freedom and power that you have for us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We go forth in his name. Amen. Peace be with you, brothers and sisters.